fantastic group of designers joining us. We have three or four. We have one more. Iman is coming. And um, today's TIDC talk is about taking action. Arts are really our follow-up to the last one, which was Step Up for Change. And our goal is to carry this on uh, for the long term and figuring out from here how we can really take action going forward. At uh, TIDC, we are a premier sourcing destination for the design community, architect firms, design build companies, retailers, and distributors. Guided by the belief, we really see the future as creative, diverse, and inclusive. We see the importance of designing for the future, for the communities and spaces we live in and grow in. And that's really why today is so important to us to continue our talks with this amazing group and take action and always looking for folks to join us in this. We see a future that's creative, innovative, healthy, and sustainable. And I know the group is going to talk to you about their goals in this um, intently. We have a great workshop ahead of us. We'll get started, shall we? Um, this session does go until 1230 and will be recorded. We'd love to hear from you throughout. So let's start with uh, Nadine. I'm, I'm Daryl and Coles, your host and the market development lead at the center. Nadine, welcome to. Hi everyone, welcome again. Lovely to see everyone here today. Uh, my name is Nadine. I am the designer service host here at TIDC. Um, I've been working here for about four years now and I'm usually the one at the kiosk that will be signing everyone in as they enter the building and um, help direct you to all the different wonderful showrooms. So um, before we start, we're going to introduce all the, um, the panelists. First, let's meet Brenda Danso. Brenda is the owner and principal designer at BD Interior Design, a Toronto-based interior design firm, a California native who relocated to Toronto in 2012. She's recognized for a contemporary style with pops of color. Uh, she's worked with the Property Brothers being featured in Kisasa, their online platform for all things home related. With a strong mental health background, she believes that design is therapy and the feel of your space has a great impact on your well-being. Uh, next up, we have Iman Stewart. She's not with us yet. She'll be joining us shortly. Um, from oh, a young... Yeah. Oh, she's here. Sorry. <laughs> My screen is so small, so <laughs> I couldn't see everyone. So welcome, Hi, Iman. Iman. Hey. <laughs> um, from a young age, Iman enjoyed rearranging her parents' furniture redecorating her room and making homes for her dolls. In her teens, she worked at a building store and at a paint and decor boutique. She also interned at TVO for their second floor renovation with Quadrangle Architects and Technion, uh, furthering her commercial projects experience. At 21, she gradua graduated from Fanshawe College with honors and more corporate education with a construction company and residential modular uh, furniture company. Known for her luminous personality, strong work ethic, and a unique sense of style, her unmatched passion and enthusiasm has led her to travel the world for inspiration. From cultural influences to food and tradition, all incorporated into her designs at Iman Stewart Inc. Uh, we also have Nikki O'Neill, an artist, a small space expert, and the principal um, at 800 square foot design firm. Her keen eye and relentless passion to explore the humanity in design has earned her a reputation amongst a new generation of pacemakers shaping Canadian cities. Underpinned by storytelling and an obsession with ex experimental design, experiential design, with a fusion of new meets old, clean lines, and her ability to capture similar human essence, she evokes the most wondrous emotions in the spaces she creates. Next, let's introduce Michael Lambie. He's new to the group this week, uh, an Ontario College of Art and Design graduate. He spent 15 years as a creative director developing award-winning TV commercials, print ads, graphic layouts, and illustrations. It was his flair for real estate investing 
and uh, love of photography and painting that opened his eyes to the world of interior design. While designing and flipping houses, he's found that his passion for creating beautiful homes was just as rewarding as selling the, fin the final properties. His vast and diverse knowledge of design has given him unique insight into the world of composition, um, spatial design, and the delicate balance of light and color. And his Instagram is at Michael underscore Lambie underscore interiors. Thank you everyone for joining Hi. us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to get us started and to sum up this, the last talk for those who weren't with us, share with us your perspectives on the design community in Canada. And we'll start with Michael. This is specific to inclusivity and Diversity. Right, right. <laughs> I was going to say that's a huge that's a big one. question, I know. <laughs> uh, well, inclusivity, it's, it's interesting. Um, I would say from my perspective, when I entered the, des the interior design space, um, it was quite different from the advertising background I had and just moving amongst the groups of uh, my count contemporaries. Um, I found it wasn't very inclusive, actually. It was, um, it was really... Um, a bunch of individuals kind of moving individually amongst themselves. So I went to workshops and um, a lot of different um, training programs and I found it really hard to, co to, to connect. And um, there could be a lot of different reasons for that, but I found that it was, I kind of felt like I was on an island and, and, and left my own devices when it comes to the sense of there's a community of design, a design community that's out there moving forward and working together to kind of establish a tone. Um, which was very different from the world of advertising, like I said, where there was really an advertising community that I was a member of. Um, um, now, what I do understand is that interior designers are kind of a, a, always been seen as a luxury. And uh, so it's kind of been an, an elite um, industry for people to access. So pretty much if you're wealthy is when you consider to use an interior designer. And so therefore it became more of like a social circle so um, when you moved in certain social circles, you use their interior designers. So there was a world that if you weren't a member of that social circle is really hard to access. And, and I think that may translate into introducing new designers into the industry as well. If you don't move in those social, social circles, you don't have access to, generally speaking, the people who would normally use interior design. So it became an elite, elite club of designers working for an elite section of the, of society right um now it's changing with social media and with um waves of designers coming out of school it's not just about social circles it's about marketing and, and, and open things up so our challenge is which i was a member even though i wasn't just coming out of school was how do i access how do i get access to that demo that wants to use designers fortunately it's it's kind of um it's spreading with HDTV and things like that. It's, you don't have to really be so wealthy and to be the ones considering. Um, a lot of my clients who reached out to me originally were first time users. They'd never used an interior design before and they weren't necessarily wealthy, but they realized they had access to that. So that's how I was able to tap into that market. Most of my clients were just people who went on Google, found me uh, based on my portfolio and never used a designer before. So they were smaller projects. But that real elite class of um, uh, people who are accustomed to this, this world never really had access to. And I think it has a lot to do with your design, sorry, your, you use who your friends used. You use who, you're, who you know who's using a designer. If you don't have access to them personally, word of mouth, then it's not open to include a new generation, one, or a new demo of people into that circle. So... For me, it's really all about marketing. Unfortunately, I have a very strong marketing background. That's really how I broke into the field, just really marketing and pushing myself and tapping into a world that wasn't really um, accessible any other way for me. Nice. Who wants to go next? Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyone else want to share their perspective? Your friend, maybe? I think um, we, we've had conversations as a group and we talked about, I mean, really when it comes to diversity, it's not a, it's not a design issue per se, it's a societal issue, right? So we talked about that when we, um, I think Michael touched a bit on familiarity, when we are 
holding an event, let's say we're having an event, right? We're going to look to who we know um, to our circle. So if that circle is not diverse, um, then that's what's going to reflect the outcome. The outcome will not be diverse. So I think it's really, it starts with that societal issue where if you look at a lot of the large organizations, um, you'll see that most people look the same, right? Um, either it's all, it's like a patriarchy or it's, you know, predominantly white, um, white males or white people, right? You don't really see diversity. So I think that kind of, that goes into design as well. Right. So I think we shouldn't look at it as this is a, just an issue within our design industry. I think it's a societal issue. And we'll get into talking more about some of the things that we can do to one, raise awareness, which is what we've started here today, um, as well as um, other efforts that we can take to, to impact that change. Absolutely. Does anybody else have anything to add? Like I would, I would even ask um, you guys at the center, or you ladies, um, predominantly like who do you see entering the center? Predominantly who are owning these vendors? Um, you know, um, I think we're trying, like what Brenda was saying, it's a societal issue. The majority of people that the system has been set up for is they don't all look like us. So we kind of look like we're coming in and people don't know where to find this as they say but I think it's it's bigger than just within the design like as Brenda's saying it's not just a design issue it's the system set up on a whole on a larger scale um we don't we don't you know what I mean like could you I don't know I I would ask you ladies like who do you who's predominantly what are the demographics at the center of designers that you do see and also at maybe vendors well, Nadine is our design services host. I know she has a perspective and I'm very engaged in that as well as our events. And it was immediately apparent to me being new to the industry. And there, are, there is definitely a gap um, predominantly as you know, you have all said, very, um, it's very much a white community when it comes to designers specifically. And um, we, there are some, because I think where we're located in the West End and sort of on the border of Mississauga, we do have a more diverse audience, I find, than um, downtown perhaps. But at the same time, um, specifically the Black community, there are not a lot. And when I've talked to you and others, um, some of that is awareness of just where we are and, and how to get there, right? So um when it comes yeah. to no i think I, I think it's good to clarify that because it's like we were just talking it's it's not necessarily just a design issue it's kind of on a larger scale so yeah, yeah. We, we are here to dissect that and figure out how we can make it not about that so but i think i think it's good that people know kind of on a larger scope how the system is set up and you know, not all of us maybe have uncles or people who yeah. own estates and stuff that we can design for our mm -hmm. first easy por portfolio. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I've met other designers who were of maybe different races or religions and they've had their uncle or their father or somebody that they could design their space to show a part of their portfolio. It might take a bit more time for other people who are either new immigrants to Canada or, um, uh, you know, they don't have the footings here or the system hasn't been necessarily set up for them here. So it's going to be a bit difficult to maybe build a portfolio to show potential clients for your marketing that, you know, this is what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, does anybody else want to say anything? Well, and I can also add from an event perspective, we have very consciously since um, I've been there, uh, always had broad representation of gender, race, as speakers, as um, when we do entertainment events, we are very, I think that's where we do a, good, a decent job. Um, and then when it comes to vendors, you've asked about vendors, um, we'll talk a bit more about that after, but in more depth, but we do recognize that as an opportunity for sure and, and really would value your input on specific vendors that we can um, approach in the center. 
And I, I also think it's, sorry, there's a two equation. It's, it's who are the clientele and who yeah. are the designers, right? I mean, when, when we look at the yeah. designers, it's predominantly white female uh, in a certain age demographic. So when I'm, <laughs> I knew, when I started attending events, <laughs> it was very quick. Sorry, it didn't take very long, so everyone knew who I was because I stood out like a sore thumb. Michael walked in; I'm the only one of the very few males there, straight black. I was only the only one, right? So it's it's now I don't look at it because everyone's asking me, oh, "Are you this? Are you that?" And there's question. I'm the oddity. I'm the unicorn in the room, right? So the perception from within our industry is an interior designer needs to look this way, and then I think that's shared outside of our industry that an interior designer looks this way. And then now that's really important because we are artists. We, are, we influence style. We influence what the next trends are. We influence really what the expectation of a beautiful space is going to be. And if that's all coming from one demo, female, white, then mm -hmm. it's not very diverse even in what the art that we put out. So I think as an industry, it, it, it behooves us to be a little bit more diverse, to have more different influence, not just culturally, but just from perspective, right? So that's what's really, really lacking even just amongst uh, us internally and then what we put out there. Because I think if you walk down the street and you ask the average person, what do you think an interior design is, designer looks like and who they are, they're gonna tell you white female and the sex they might be say um, white male homosexual. And so those are gonna be their two, and everybody else is not really gonna fit into that, to that. And they're not gonna really, people always give me a little weird face when I tell them what I do, right? You sure? And they kind of reassess, trying to figure out how I fit into this, into this, uh -huh. this demo, right? Yeah. So well, let's go to the next question and we'll get into more depth. All right. Uh, from here, let's look more intently at where the opportunities are. Um, why do you think the Canadian design community disproportionately reflects diverse race and color and gender? And what are the driving forces behind that? I know we um, talked a bit about this already, but I'm sure you have other things you'd like to add. Yeah, I can I can address this one. I mean, we we've kind of mentioned a lot of it or a good majority of it in the conversations that we've already started to have. But I think when we look at um, society, because I, the the theme that's kind of been repeated is this idea that none of this is stemming in uh, from the design industry. So it's difficult to answer that question within that context. So we have to look um, outside of that. So when we look at society, I think what's important to to break it down into more of a simple way is to see how society is rationed, to see who's narrating that and to see how it's acted upon. So when I talk about um, how it's rationed, when we look at the, um, the economic inequality that, or the social um, makeup, um, because as we've all mentioned, uh, design is, uh, we would look at it as almost like a luxury profession. Um, so when you have um, immigrant parents or parents, uh, you know, when I was growing up and I had mentioned this in our first um, talk, that wasn't a, the arts wasn't something that was really encouraged. You know what I mean? When you're looking at who, who designed services, it, uh, like Michael said, is generally uh, a population that has disposable income. So when you're looking at immigrants or somebody that's coming into the country or a, a large majority of the black population that doesn't have that disposable income, that's not something that they're gonna tend to encourage their children to go into. They're gonna encourage them to go into something that is, um, you know, like a doctor, a lawyer, uh, you know, that is more solid. Um, and then when we talk about narrated, um, how is society narrated? When you look at, um, and, that can, and that can be from the perspective of um, education and also um, media. So when we talk about education, uh, and again, we mentioned this a little bit last time, is this idea of, um, what we are taught and how design, essentially the, the design world in Canada is shaped very much by um, a Eurocentric design view. And when you're being taught that in schools and that's what is celebrated and that's what you see in magazines that also shapes the way that people um, view the design industry as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. So media, for example, uh, the fact that we don't see a lot of diversity um, on the screen or in magazines um, that curates the conversation as to what the design industry looks like, what the styles look like, um, and that all speaks to why we don't see or why we don't see diversity, but also the feeling of not feeling in, um, in welcomed 
into that space as well. If you don't see yourself, then you don't, you're not, you don't have the tendency to want to step into that. Um, and the last one that I mentioned is how it's acted upon. And when I, this is really important because I feel, because I think when we're going about our work as designers, it's very easy to think about that client designer relationship. So you're thinking about how can I appease or design for that client, but I think we, we have to think on a broader, broader scale when it comes to design because design is the system in which things are set up so that people can forget. For example, if you're talking about somebody who's designing um, our society or outside, and how do I put this? Okay, let me say it this way. Design is never neutral. When you design something, it is always designing to the benefit of somebody and to the exclusion of somebody else. So it's really important that we think about who is being silenced by what we design. A good example of this is, for example, if you're designing um, the street, for example, and you design it with no ramps, right? You have all the curbs and there's no ramps. Immediately, that excludes the... Um, um, disabled population because they now cannot get onto the sidewalk, right? So you have to think about in everything that we design, who is not included in that, um, in what we're designing. So thinking and remembering that design is never neutral allows us to uh, think about how we move forward in that uh, conversation. The fact that you, th the, the, the idea of perhaps creating a body that, um, or within that, um, sorry, within that discussion, creating a body that questions that. How do we, ha like, who is it that we are no longer including in this conversation? And how do we include that as part of the process? Does that make sense? I'm kind of rambling, but if that makes sense. Yeah. And Michael and I actually talked about this as well um, before. It's a very important topic. Like how do we, and I think it did come up in the last session as well. You know, how do we have culturally appropriate appropriated, um, design, right? And that's right. not for everyone. Like Michael said, suggested that's not him. And I don't know that that's actually race necessarily. It's, it's how do we elevate design in Canada to a new level, right? And yeah, it's, it's it, sorry, go ahead. No, finish because I'll follow up on what you said previously. No, 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 go ahead, Bruna, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Nikki had some really great points that were highlighted, right? Um, she talked about like changing the narrative, right? And then also changing the narrator, which I think is really important. And this is why we're having the conversation um, because for far too long, many people have been excluded from these conversations, right? So when we're having these events and things like that or conversations about design, a lot of people were left from that table. Right. So now that conversation is not diverse. When we're looking at diversity, we, you know, I know it's a buzzword that's often thrown around, but we really need to dissect that. What does that look like? That means that we are listening to people of different race, ethnicity, male, female. So when we look at our design industry, then we can then say, you know what, we don't have that evidence that it is diverse. Right. Because we're not hearing from different voices. So I think it's um, I like that theme that I think it's coming up is that changing the narrative the narrator um, and changing the narrative as well. Mm -hmm. And I think what's important to highlight because it's easy for people to feel resist resistant to that um, idea of excluding people. Um, it's not something that people do consciously, you know? Like when we talk about who's being excluded from these conversations, it almost implies that someone's going around feeling like, oh, we don't want to include them all in this table. So I think people should not be resistant to this idea of exclusion. The way that things are set up is so that you move through life in a way where you don't think about these things. So now that we're introducing that word into that conversation, it's not to say that people are doing this deliberately, but now that we are aware of it, we must be deliberate in changing it. Michael, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, I, I was I was going to expand on the narrative part uh, uh, because in I'm sure the other designers can attest to this. A lot of clients approach you wanting you to make a space that they've seen already. Oh, I love this. I've seen this. I've seen this. I've seen this. And so you you find yourself repeating stuff and or you you you're you're gently trying to say, okay, well we can push the envelope a little bit. But generally speaking, people want what they've seen. 
and they they can't really imagine what's not there because obviously that's what our job is. So the narr the the narrative is being created by us, what we're creating. So we gotta it's us as a design industry have to open up that that um mm. the potential of what a space could look like, what's possible. All kitchens don't have to be pure white, for example. So I mean, we have to start introducing and pushing those. And if you are someone that's is comfortable doing that, that's fantastic. But it, it limits the accessibility to being creative when it comes to what we're putting out there. So then the narrative is created by us as a creative entity. And that has to be something we need to talk about from, from the beginning. What are we providing out there? So it opens up our jobs that we can actually be more expressive as the artists and designers. Absolutely. Anyone else? We're um, at the half hour mark. We have an hour. Wow. I know a lot of people have joined since our intro. So we have some, um, we're going to do, now go into a bit of a deeper dive on some of the key themes that we're hearing. Then we'll have a Q&A, but please feel free for those who have joined us to you know, type in the chat, tell us a bit about yourself, your views. We'd love to hear from you. That's part of this. And um, we will have a Q&A, as I said, at the, towards, once we get through a few more questions. So from what we're hearing, there are really three key areas we can focus on, right? So there's equity in design forums for, for today. There's media exposure. And I've heard a lot about personal biases in the industry. Uh, we know also education has come up and that's such a huge topic. We're actually going to table that one for our next talk on July 28th. Um, but so for now, Let's say if you were involved in planning industry events, conferences, and discussion forums, how would you approach diversity and inclusion? And what do you see as important topics that perhaps traditional forums are missing? Who would like to go first on that one? I think to continue with the theme, it really it's about changing familiarity, right? So we talked about if we are holding an event, we kind of go to who are the designers that we already know right and then they often end up on that selection or on that panel right um we want things to change where we are not being invited to come and talk about race relations because you know after all we're not diversity trainers right um we do have this experience and so i think the first start um or the first starting point is to start that awareness and so i think based on our lived experience we're in a good position to start that um, but I feel like the changing familiarity has to be really intentional. I know, Carolyn, you talked a little bit about that. So if you're having an event, you really want to look at, okay, what type of event am I doing? Um, let me look to see how I can make this diverse, right? Because again, um, we also have to look at practice policy and actually putting things, implementing things, right? So diversity is not just, I have a black friend or I have, I know one you know, design person who's black or I love all people or I see no color, right? That's not enough. Um, it really, there has to be uh, policy changes in effect. Um, you have to look at your practice. And then also when, what's your process when you're looking for panelists, right? Are you making sure again that once that panelist is finalized, it is a representation of, you know, what diversity should look like. Um, I think Another area too is really interrogating your own role and structures of racism. So we have to really reflect to see, because you can be a designer, you can be a vendor, right? So depending on your role, you'd be able to see, you know, what, what, how can I affect change, right? If I'm a designer, for example, as collectives, we've talked about going into schools and um, speaking with students about what interior design is. And we're being selective around what schools we're going to, because we're going into the schools where they're not hearing about the interior design field, right? So really looking at your role and examining what it is that you can contribute to actually affect that change. So I think it's, um, it's something that each person or each individual or organization has to assess for themselves. And that's really the starting point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's also just to add a little point on that. It's about, um, What's your purpose? What's your integrity on it? And regurgitation. Do you want to put on the same events that everybody's seen with the same speakers? Or are you bringing something new? Are you bringing something fresh? Are you bringing something innovative? Are you taking a bit of a chance? So it's like panelists putting on a lot of people. I would say majority of people don't 
can't name a designer, an interior designer or two. So you, there's maybe two or three real celebrity high profile designers out there. So pretty much your panel is going to be new to most people. So then it doesn't have to be the inner circle panel that you're comfortable with. You're introducing new talent anyways. So why not introduce, really introduce new talent all the time and make it that your mandate so that you're bringing something fresh. It's a fresh conversation and you're bringing up a, a, um, a, a new perspective, right? So that has to do with that, that um, organization's integrity and what's their purpose and what they're trying to put up there. And if we're dealing in a creative world, my gosh, let's create something new. It should be new every time, right? It shouldn't be a regurgitation. So if it's the same panel or the same people or the same representation that you've seen already, well, you're not creating anything. You're not adding to the conversation. And you're, not, you're not providing your audience with something fresh and new. And I think it's not just related to race, right? We talk about like oftentimes oh, maybe an all-female panel, right? That needs to be looked at. Can we bring people of different ethnicities? Because we know as it comes to culture and design, there's so many there's so many things that we have not even tapped into because there isn't visibility around it and we're not approaching those people who you know that's their expertise right so there's so much in design that i feel we have not seen in this western world and yet canada is so diverse and we have so many different cultures and right. so we really need to expand um on what design can actually look like absolutely yeah mm-hmm yeah, I think that's a great point because it when you look at design trade shows or even print and media, you especially in Canada, I'm going I'm going to speak about Canada, I'm not going to speak about America or anywhere else, but we don't do we see the proper rep representation of what Canada is? Canada is a mosaic of many different cultures, um, many different religions. Like it I don't even think in in our industry you even see that like i would think our design industry would be leading in the sense of creativity and culture because of the impact of so many cultures but that goes to show we're still very westernized we're still following a specific genre of design style you know the gray and the white kitchens like this canada should really be i think at the leading front because we have so many different cultures that make up canada um to the beginning of indigenous people to a huge caribbean population african population asian it, there's so it's so vast and i think that canada the producers or the people in print they sh the publishers people should really be looking and seeing what's fresh what's new like what michael was saying is are we properly re reflecting the mosaic of canada you know what i mean that should also be within our arts and in design so that's a huge lack that is up at the top that needs to be trickled down now and we need to get that exposure. I like how um, Iman framed that because um, whether something is designed in this pretty package, um, I, I, I think we, when you go into somebody's home, regardless of whether it's in this pretty package, people design their space regardless. And if we're thinking about how people use space and how people um, express themselves within our homes, and because Canada is such a mosaic, there has to be, we have to recognize that there's some disconnection. If the population that you're servicing has this colored view and approach to design, why aren't we seeing it? So we have to look at where those points are where that is being filtered away you know what i mean and, and i think within those areas where that's being filtered away that's the, that's where we need to target it because yeah. it should absolutely be a reflection of what that is what what we're living right but we don't see that so i think that comes in media that comes in um i mean generally i, I want to say media because that's what we end up seeing right I think it's been a taboo up until recently to even have these conversations, right? Because I think because for us on the panel, because it's been our lived experience, it's been easier to have that conversation amongst each other. We talked about familiarity. So if I know that Nikki is experiencing the same thing that I am or going through something similar, I'm comfortable with talking to her about it. Whereas I may not talk to, you know, my friend who's Caucasian because they can't really relate, right? And previously we... Right weren't having these conversations openly, um, even though there's been this problem that's existed for so long, right? So I think that's why it's so important for us to, ha to have these conversations to really see that 
a problem exists because again, when we bring up the topic of diversity, we're all quick to say, well, no, we are diverse and we are treating people with fair opportunity. However, there is no evidence of that right now. Right. And so I think that's, that has to be highlighted. And why is that? Is it, why aren't we having the conversation, Jimmy? The root of that. The root? Well, it's multifaceted, right? I mean, when you think about the systemic issue in Canada or in U.S. or just in the world, that's a huge, when we're looking at dissecting the root of that or the stem, it's a huge um, thing to dissect, right? Then we're going down to like, you know, slavery, right? Mm -hmm. we're going down to that systemic oppression. So that's a it's so broad, right? There's so many layers of it. We look at the school systems. Why right. is it we strive for our kids to go to a good school? Because there's schools that exist where it happens to be in the priority neighborhoods where the education is not that great. And then we can look at, you know, the layers of that as well, right? Why is it that myself and maybe Nikki or someone else um, as visible minorities are you know, hearing about design at such an early age because our parents are immigrants and we, you know, our parents came here at a later age and we weren't encouraged to go into the arts. So when we talk about the root issue of, you know, the systemic problem that we face, it's not a, a one worded answer. It's, it goes back to the history, right? Why is it that we have a Eurocentric um, style of design, right? We can break that down into many areas as well. Why is it that, you know, we're talking about race and race is a social construct, right? Um, so it's such a huge, um, I think the focus should not really be so much on like, you know, where does it stem from? Because it's, it's just too big. It's really focusing on we're aware that there is an issue. We know that right. there is diversity, you know, and not just design, but in many fields. And mm -hmm. since we're in the design field, what can we do? What are the steps that we need to take? Because I think um, for the past month now, we've been talking, sharing our experiences, and people are overwhelmed. They're like, where do we go with all this information, right? So this is why we're hoping to talk about the next steps. How do we affect change? Mm -hmm. How do we go into the schools and start having those conversations so children who didn't have the opportunity before to hear about design are now hearing about it? How do we um, maybe hold trade events or panel discussions where it is now diverse and you're reflecting different race and ethnicity. So I think that's, it's how do we move forward to actually affect change because, you know, as we sit and think about the root causes, it's, it's, it's really overwhelming. Um, white people start to feel guilty because they feel like they should, which they shouldn't. Um, black people start to feel overwhelmed and burdened for the history. Um, I guess the history that we we are aware of so it's just it's really um I don't know what the word to use but it's I think it's all overwhelming so I think it's best to focus mm -hmm. on how do we move forward how do we affect change and how do we start to change our familiarity from our circles if my circle is all black that is also problematic right if your circle is all white that is problematic right so how do we start to change our familiarity so that this is the norm um, where diversity is the norm, because right now we're seeing that it's not, and as much as we, we, we think it is. Well said, well said. I, I wanted to add, because my perspective is a little bit different. Um, although I agree with Brendan, I think that in order for us to have these tangible items to know how we move forward, I think that the way that my mind works is a little bit different in the sense that, um, I'll give you an analogy. If you have a tree, like an apple tree, and you keep producing bad fruit and you go to the fruit and you try to fix individual fruits or perhaps you have a, a problem with the leaves and you try to fix those individual leaves, um, it becomes overwhelming because there's so many branches and there's so many fruit. But if you go to that root and if you fix that root, then you start producing good fruit. So in my mind, when it comes to tackling this issue, I think it's I think it's important that we identify on an individual level that we have our individual work to do. Like we had mentioned before, none of us are race experts, but that doesn't negate us from the fact that we have power. We can still do something. And in us doing our work in the area that we um, have our expertise, it's like taking care of the fruit, for example. But there are people that have the ability to get closer to the root. 
So as we are pacifying the symptoms, for example, us having this discussion about design and how we can do design activism and how we can um, have this design equality, great, that takes care of the fruit and the leaves. But there are people that we must, at, on an individual level, now stepping out of the design space, just as human beings, um, um, asking people or, um, or um, raising awareness so that the people whose job is to take care of the roots, like our politicians and you know people who work on the root, they do their job the way that it's meant to be done. So I think we step. There is things that we can do within the design space, like Brenda was talking, but also that doesn't. I don't think that I don't think we should forget that as individuals we have power um, in order to to create long lasting change. Because in my head, in order for long lasting change to occur, it must happen at the root. There's no other way. You can't pick all the fruit. You can't, um, you know, treat all the leaves. You you have to treat the root. So, yeah. they're, they're a fantastic point. Nikki. I totally agree. And I think I think we have to. So we we all have to acknowledge it. First of all, for you to make a change, you have to acknowledge that there is something that needs to be changed. And I think for us living in the GTA, it should be incredibly obvious. You jump on the TTC and you look around you. It's not all white you go downtown you walk it's not all white it's not all anything so if you work in an industry or if you go into an, an environment and it's all white it, it's not that it's a bad thing but you should be aware that okay why is this <laughs> why is this not something but and then so once you acknowledge and you're and and it's not about blame it's just this is the scenario that we live in that there's still there's still industry there's still environments where it's pretty not inclusive and then you look at what Toronto's great about. I mean, think about the the the, cult, the the restaurant industry. What Toronto's known around the world, how amazing our food is. And it's not because it's all white or it's all one thing. It's because it's so diverse. You can go downtown and have authentic food from everywhere all the time. And it's internationally known that Toronto has an amazing culinary experience available to you. So if all these people are here, we have all these influences and we're creating this amazing environment for for food and it's turning into fashion, it's turning into film, how does it stop there? And why would you want it to stop there? Why doesn't it apply to our arts? Why doesn't it apply to everything in our industry? So we know we have the talent here. We know we have the influences here, but it's not everywhere. So that's the first thing is there is a definite exclusion happening. Now let's change it. And the desire to change it should be because everybody benefits. It's amazing when we have all these influences pulling together, pushing each other so that when we go downtown, I don't always have to have, well, I, I have diverse, <laughs> I have diverse selection when it comes to food. I can go spicy, I can go flavor, I can go savory, or I can go, you know, vegan, I can do whatever. And these things are going to be popping up, but it takes us to, to, to identify that this is missing and that the opposite is probably a better scenario and more uh, exciting for all of us. And now let's make that happen. So whenever we're in an environment where we're see there, when I go into an environment and I'm the only male, the only black, or the only this, I'm aware, right? And, I'm, and I can't be the only one who's aware. You, you kind of have to know that I'm just the only one. So why is that? Really, are there no other people out here who are created that should be with us right now? And therefore, how do we make that change? Who are we inviting? Who are we exposing ourselves to? If it's a desire to make right. that change, then the conversation becomes powerful. But I think most people move through life just comfortably. And Nikki was talking about this. We're just comfortable moving through life without effort. And... I don't have to make a change. It doesn't really affect me. It's not a thing. And we have to have a desire to want that to be changed. And once we acknowledge it, once we know that there is something to be changed and we're, we will be better for it, now hopefully we're inspired to do, to create that change. Yeah. And I just want to add one last thing too, uh, going back to Nikki's point, which was really good because I think oftentimes when we have these conversations and we walk away, the burden then often falls on us a lot. Um, to feel like we have to do things. So we on the panelists now are going to the schools. We are now, you know, joining trade events and doing this, right? And mobilizing change. Um, so I think when Nikki was talking, it just reminded me about just the institutional power, right? Because that's where it is. So when we're looking at the large organizations or magazine publications, there has to be accountability, right? So that first starts with the awareness, right? So we know that there is an issue. We all have to make noise, right? We can't be comfortable, right? Um, there has to be some discomfort in our comfort. Um, so we really need to like take action, everyone, right? So if you observe something, you have to take action, right? So if it's 
whether you're writing to the media publication or whether you're um, going out to vote to affect change, whatever that looks like, whether you're creating new policies, I think that part is really huge, like Nikki was saying, because otherwise, I mean, we will be doing a lot of work, but then things are not changing. When we look at that hierarchy, things are not changing from the top level, and it's really hard to affect change from just the bottom going up, right? Yeah. Great. <clears throat> We've got some comments and um, I'd love to share with you. We have uh, Carly Nemteen, who's from Carriage Lane Designs in the Collective Workspace. She says a big yes, but Carly, we'd love to hear more what you mean by that. So type it in there or put your hand up. We'd love to have you in the chat. Um, we have from Temi, I love this. This is making my heart sing. From Temi Teo. She works also in fashion, and it's heartbreaking that we have to go to the States and in Europe for trade shows. Perhaps the creative community in Canada can be more interactive and unionized, quote unquote, where creatives are able to share the same vision, mission, and values, as well as coach up and coming, and coming individuals that want to be part of the community. I think that's a very interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. point. We can yeah, it's very what powerful. You were saying, Michael, how we can learn from other um, industries, and that's a big one. It's very powerful because it's it's definitely we can learn from other industries, and it's, we can't under we can't deny the power of inspiration, right? And and who are we aspiring to? And we touched upon this earlier about what are we teaching our, our children? What's accessible to them? Um, there's a whole generation of creatives out there who are not being inspired and encouraged to express themselves through this medium. And I remember being in, at uh, OCAD, OCA and, and college. It wasn't until my third year that I ever saw. So they brought in guest artists all the time. It was an amazing experience. And I was never conscious of that, even though I was one of the few Blacks in, my, in, in the college at the time. And I remember once they brought in my third year, they brought in a Black artist. And he was at the front and they didn't bring him in because he was black he was just a good artist right it wasn't black artist day it was just we have an artist and i remember just finding myself sitting up a little straighter and thinking oh so i can do this <laughs> like i'm gonna do this anyways but you just proved that i'm not gonna be it's, it's doable it was so powerful for me and it's very possible no one else in the room even felt that or knew that but it meant so much to me to see myself represented up front as a success and that and not just an oddity so I was inspired, right? And to, to, so for everybody to be, um, to know that this is accessible to them, then we're gonna be inundated by creatives who, who are now not trying to break down this barrier. So we're out there where we exist, let's make an effort to say to everybody, again, the label of black anything first is, is, is uncomfortable. It's, it's, we are designers who just happen to be black and who happen to be male, happen to be female, happen to be straight, it doesn't matter. Are you creative? Are you good? You're welcome. Let's bring it on, but let's inspire all of you so you don't have to fit into this norm because that's limited, right? Mm -hmm. And I think just to, to add to that point, um, when we talk about, when we were talking about um, uh, conferences and forums and all these things, the, ent the entire point of these things is to come together to create. So in any, any creative knows that as soon as you start putting up limitations that limits the um the depth and the like the, the vastness of your creativity so that just goes to to the point of this this diversity and li like the removal of this um of these barriers it allows us to think in a more multi-dimensional way to include so many different perspectives so just i think if we think about it in that way is like let's remove as many barriers as possible so that we can get um the fruit of what it is that we're there to do is the best right like, I, I guess I'm just think, simplifying it in the sense of like that idea of l removing these limitations across the board, whatever that looks like. If you're planning something, think about what those limitations are and then how do I remove that so I can get to the best product. Yes. Yeah. And, as I, said, I, I think, I think if, if as a design industry, and I think if we're speaking to most people in the industry right now, how beneficial would it be if more of the general population realized that, that using a designer is a good idea? Nikki mentions for one second that you're designing your home whether you're conscious about it or not, whether you're good at, you're good at it or not. It's just if we as an industry should let people know that using designers is probably going to get you a better product. So 
meta, the, despite what you think a designer is going to bring to your space, there's a designer out there for you. So start looking towards this. It's going to increase the wave of people reaching out to us as designers. So they need to know platform. I, I remember, I rem, this is, this is, I'm going to say this properly. When my career started, I received probably a predominant amount of, um, Clients calling me who, who are of Indian descent, from the Indian community who are brown. It was really shocking. Like 60% of my clients were calling in. And, and I remember getting close to a few clients and asking them, what made you pick up the phone and call me? Obviously, I ask every client why you call me, but never about the race thing or anything like that. And I've got, and a few, more than a few has told me, well, you know what? There really are not any brown designers out there. And, and or who are not doing traditional Indian stuff. We don't want that. We want so their next thing so i was kind of the next default which was interesting <laughs> right but that's even something there's a huge opportunity with our indian population out there for indian designers right now coming up there's a demo out there looking for you and they can't find you so who knows how much people are not pulling the trigger for whatever their their comfort zone because you're inviting someone into your home and you need to be comfortable but for someone to actually say that to me i i was selecting you because when i was looking out there for designers i didn't realize there wasn't, I didn't have people I can relate to you. It's okay. extremely disappointing. This is Toronto. How can you ever say that about any industry, right? So we're yeah. not putting out there. So there's a whole demo that's limiting the, um, the, the, the workflow into our industry, right? Because we're not putting out there the visual panel that is really representative of who we are. Oh, absolutely. That's a really yeah. good point. That's a really good point. Yeah. Like I was just reading what Temi wrote in. I know I'm not the host. No, go for it, anyone. Host, but uh, <laughs> it could be. Uh, Temi just wrote. I just I just had to look at the comment, but she I like the point that she talks about in terms of if the government will take on the task to encourage mm -hmm. creatives. And like, as we're talking about this, even with Michael saying how he saw another man who was an artist who happened to be black come into his school, uh, he was able to say, "Wow, like I." I'm definitely going to do this because, you know, I can, I can uh, relate to somebody. That is something that needs to be done on a bigger level, like government and creatives. And, you know, we need to have certain programs or just certain ways, because what are we going to do after this? All four of us are now going to march up into schools and start, you know, demanding that we have a day where we talk to students and inspire them. It has to be done at a, a bigger level uh, than just that. So, um, it's something that is much bigger that we need to tackle. And I think that if we have these discussions, because you have to have conversation, we have to be able to relate to one another, we have to be able to learn. And how does that happen is through discussion. So I think just based off of Temi's, well, she also talks about how Italy decided to take on production. And, you know, definitely we look at Canada's design market. There's only a few Canadian manufacturers that do design furniture here. And then you look at our lumber industry in Alberta, there's a massive lumber industry. Why are we not using local lumber and supplying, you know, local trades and, and doing the manufacturing thing? We could be mass producers of that. So there's certain things that governmental, like in the government that I think we have to look at as well, because are we getting good prices for the lumber to create um, kiln dried great sofas? You know what I mean? Like, are we getting getting incentives in that regard. There's there's bigger things that I think we need to look at in terms of our industry manufacturing. And just kind of going back to what Michael spoke about, about our flair of culture. Toronto is a big city for that. Vancouver has a diverse Asian population as well. I will say through my travels, Toronto, well, Canada as a whole, is one place that we know the difference between a Filipino person a Vietnamese person like because we taste all the different food we have all the different culture so we're able to I go to the states and they'll look at like a Korean person and be like oh they're Chinese and I'm like no guy because they're a little bit more segregated we, we we're more mixed in together um so we we can tell the difference so just like what everybody's saying here we know that there's something that's going on. But I think the root definitely has to be certain things that governments and our leaders have to step up and doing. When I, I once lived in Montreal, and the one thing I loved about Montreal is the culture there. The culture in Montreal is European, but the one thing that I liked is they were big on the arts. They had a lot of art expos, like expos. They had a lot of music, a lot of gatherings where it was very, very common. And you would see a mother or a father with their child or somebody. It was normal, like that they're out at a concert and it was just mixed where I feel like Toronto can sometimes be like, 
okay, well, there's an event and then you don't really see it like family or or involved like people in, in Montreal will be it's like six o'clock in the afternoon and they're at a park or they're doing pottery because it's just more art influence mm -hmm. so it's a part of more of their culture there's a lot of government incentives that do put into these art programs to want to help support artists so we are seeing what people are cultivating what people are creating I don't necessarily we see, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that the Canadian government isn't doing anything now. I, I hope there's doing more, especially since this climate that we've all been seeing at this moment. But that's that's something that needs to be happening up at the top. It's just not our discussions and, you know, us marching into schools and, you know, trying to help out mobilizing, like Brenda said. It, it has to be on a larger scale. So I think us having these conversations conversations are great it's just we have to continue to focus on what's the follow-up and how are we going to really get these action plans uh which is you know what we're trying to do after this talk is put those action plans right. in place exactly. those are great points Iman. um i'm right, trying to write down everything you're saying to all of you <laughs> Well, it's recorded it's, 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 yes, it's recorded it <laughs> we we'll look back <laughs> there was there was one more question that I'm kind of like oh I got it I want to talk about this so bad um, I think um, Mia had had asked what uh, design cultural appropriation is I don't know if we have enough time but I would really like us to kind of talk about that because I think that's really important we have a few other questions so let's start with that one okay uh, awesome um, um, this one is really I don't know it gets me really fired up when I think about this because we have when you talk about a, a, a population or populations, because when we talk about cultural appropriation and design, it happens not just in the black community, all, all um, cultures, where when you, talk, when you talk about a group of people that is not seen and heard, and they, the, the things that they do and the, uh, the work, the art and the work that they put out is so steeped and rooted in history and tradition and root ritual. And when they're doing that and putting that out and it's disregarded and not seen, and all of a sudden, um, some Westerner or, you know, somebody that doesn't look like them um, takes that um, culture, product, whatever that is, and puts it in front of um, people and omits where it comes from, that is deeply painful to the community. Oh I see that so often. I see it so often where, um, you know, you have, for example, in the design community, what, what we end up seeing a lot of times is, for example, in magazines or on television where they have like the global issue or whatever. And the only reason it's, it's now seen is because it has been paired with a white person mm -hmm. where no, uh, no and... um, relation to where that piece of item has come from, where it's rooted, who it... it, it Whoops. Oh, Sherry. Internet couldn't handle it. If she was fired. <laughs> <laughs> she was burning. Can you guys hear me? No. no. You're, you're back. Yeah. You're back now. Oh, okay. What was the last thing that you guys heard? No, but you were like this. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I'm just saying, but nothing, nothing, nothing about that. No proceeds from... Um, the one, the thing that you see that, uh, the thing that's very apparent and you see it widely is in yoga, for example, uh, this, and I know I'm not talking about design, but I just want to make it clear to people. For example, in yoga, you have this, uh, there's tons of yoga studios everywhere, but nothing, none of that proceeds, none of the money goes back to the people who have actually created that, um, that practice. And it's the same thing in the design community. So when you, when it comes to cultural appropriation, what you need to recognize that there's a difference between cultural appropriation and appreciation and what you should be doing is appreciation because appreciation allows you to still have that portion where people the where the the history in which it came from the culture in which it came from is highlighted they benefit from it but if you're taking something from sorry i'm getting really heated now <laughs> when you take something from a culture and it doesn't go back to the people in which um you have taken it from and i want to say stolen it from that's a problem if you don't give them recognition, there is no, they don't um, benefit financially from it. There is a problem in that. Yeah. Um, so and, anyways. And, and, or influence. You can be influenced. We're all influenced by everything. But there's a difference between influence and, and taking the credit and, and, and applying it as if it's your own. 
And it's, it's just a huge difference in that. And then when you're respectfully influenced by something, you're going to pay tribute to that and you're going to acknowledge that and you're going to pass that along. But we see specials all the time that come on TV and shows and where designers are traveling the world and they're, they're an expert for a minute on someone else's culture and, and fabric or, 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 or uh, stuff. And then they move on and they may start incorporating. But, but hold on a second. You know, you weren't an expert. You're being influenced. Let's, let's dive into that because we're all being... We're not staying in Toronto and being influenced just by Toronto and just circling Toronto and getting our design ideas from Toronto. We're pulling it from the world. Well, let's really bring the world. The world's actually here. Let's, let's bring that in and help it influence right on. It's not right. that you have to um, hire a black designer to put a um, mask on your wall, right? Or hire an Asian designer to give you feng shui. But it's, it's a question of really understanding the influence of that and, under, and realizing that we're, it's rich enough that if you like this influence and if this is something that you want to see kind of created somewhere else, then there, there is a source. There is a source that's gonna open you up to a world far beyond what we just have access to. And if you're profiting from that culture, I wanna say must, so I will say must, you must put something back into the culture in which you took from. So if you, like, if you set up products and you're taking products from a, a culture, think about donating to that culture. Let them benefit from the fact that you have been so inspired by the thing that you've, you've, you've seen and touched by it. Um, I don't know. That. I think it's important. That's a great idea. Yeah. So we have a um, few other questions. We have from Camille Mitchell. It sounds like she's very interested in a collaborative large commercial project. Our large, her question is, are large commercial projects an option for black interior designers? Many of you work alone or with a small team on smaller projects. Are there challenges or interests with going after larger projects? And would you consider collaborating to form a larger team? Absolutely. I do that. I do that anyways. I work on residential and commercial spaces. So when I'm working mm -hmm. on commercial spaces, although I have a small team, um, my team grow, my team can get larger because I then um, hire people on or I, I yeah. um, collaborate with other designers. So I've, I've collaborated with other designers when it comes to larger projects. So that's something that I'm already doing. And I think there's a couple of the people on the panel that are also doing that as well. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. No, same thing. Residential commercial. I think the, the, the thing about it is a lot of times designers don't get recognition for those type of jobs. So when you, so you're not really aware and you probably never will be aware of who actually created those, but it's also a question of opportunity. Being in the room or being an option for when people are considering who do we use, it's, it's, it's either going to call you or not. So if I don't know you directly, how did you find me? How would you call me? But I think we're all, if anybody else can do it, we can do it too. I mean, that's, that's really it. There's no reason. It's who are you choosing to do it, and that should be based on aesthetic and, and, and connection, right? Personal connection. Do you believe yeah. you feel comfortable with it, and what's their aesthetic? What I'm hearing there is a desire for some to be more involved on that scale, but perhaps not the knowledge of how to do that. I think there are some barriers to accessibility. I, for example, when I look at the commercial projects that I've gotten, it's by referrals, right? Um, but I'm just thinking of maybe how much more I may not have the opportunity to, um, to actually be involved in because of that familiarity piece that we talked about, right? So if we have builders, maybe if a builder has a new construction and they're looking at familiarity and that fam familiarity looks one way, that's, a, that's where that you know, that's who's getting that job, right? Um, so I think there are some barriers there, but I think most of us on this panel are doing commercial already. We have a team. We are the face of our brand, but we still have contractors and architects and a larger team that we actually work with to actually do new builds. Um, Iman does um, projects here in Toronto as well as um, in the tropics, right? So we all have a diverse background and we're We've been doing this, right? So I think we're just now getting that visibility for people to actually hear about our who we are and what we do. And you've also formed maybe Brenda. This is a good time to talk about your um, your your new. Uh, I know it's on Instagram. I'm not sure if you have it in other forums, but your community form. So, yeah. So I think. Um, a few months back, about six months ago now, um, Iman and I were having a conversation uh, because we were just, you know, talking about representation, right, and what that looked like here in Toronto. When I first started a few years ago, I was 
just curious about like, were there other black designers? Cause I didn't really see any. So I started to, to search for other black designers and probably within a span of a few years found like five total which was pretty problematic. So about six months ago, Iman and I started having this conversation again. Um, so in the US, there is the Black Interior Design Network and there it's a huge network. And so we wanted to connect with them and start a chapter here. Um, so just recently, a month ago, Iman and I, you know, and I think Michael too, Michael and I were talking because I reached out to Michael and I said, Michael, who are other black designers? He's like, oh, I don't know, I think about three. I was, so then I go to Iman, who are other black designers? He's like, oh, I'll, I'll tag you in three, right? So the numbers were just so low. Um, and so we just started having dialogue around being really intentional to look for other designers who were visible minorities. And so through that, um, we started the Black uh, Canadian Interior Design Network here, and really the purpose of that was for, one, increase the visibility for us to be aware, not just us on the panel, but for you all to be aware that there are Black designers here locally, and we don't have to go to the U.S. to look for them. And then also for us to have um, a supportive group and a network that we can just have these conversations with, and I'm glad we can have the conversation now um, as a whole, and then to also eliminate the barrier of hearing from the media or producers or uh, different organizations that we we can't find you guys, right? So that's no longer an excuse because we are here. Um, and so we, you know, we're working really hard to build that network. Um, we've been talking about, again, the diversity conversation around action steps that we can take um, and as much as we're Black, we're visible minorities, it doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything, right? Because I think we all have a role to play. Um, so we're working on a lot of different things of just really how we can support each other, first and foremost, and then how we can also affect change by figuring out what action steps we can take. Uh, is that a good segue for us to kind of talk about some of the action items that we, we've kind of discussed as a group? Um, yes. Is that okay, Darylin? Yes, there are a few other questions, but maybe we'll come back to them if we have time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of them uh, that is important to us, uh, again, um, when it comes to promoting work and being visible, I think what's important to us as Black designers is promoting our work alongside um, white and non-person of color uh, counterparts, like not just during Black History Month or when there's civil unrest. Um, at the heart of it, again, we are artists, so we want to make sure that our work is seeing, our work is being seen not because we are Black, but because our work is good. So it's, imp it's important for people that are promoting our work to do so because it's good and amongst others, not just because it's this, you know, this stuck segment or we're doing like a Black panel or whatever that is. Um, also including black designers voices as experts. So for example, we spoke about it before, but inviting black designers to speak on your panels um, or your events, also um, paying speaker fees because fees, that's something that there's a, a disparity when it comes to speakers fees where we're not necessarily compensated um, the same as our white counterparts. Um, and also to discuss topics beyond race and diversity because at the end of the day, our expertise is in design. Um, also looking to partner with black designers on licensing deals or um, on, in the industry regarding products or material, materials, hiring black designers um, as ambassadors for your brand. Um, and, and I say black, and this is, this is the topic we're talking about, but just, you know, just diverse in general, you know? Um, let that again be a representation of the, the country that we're serving. Um, access, um, access your, sorry, assess your buy-in minimums as a discriminatory amount. So that's a really important one. Um, you know, looking within the practices of your own organization and then stop pushing. Um, oh, sorry, this is one that I, I added. Sorry, guys, I added this at the end. Uh, <laughs> stop pushing, <laughs> stop pushing Eurocentric design as the design blueprint. And I think that's really important, especially because we are in Canada. It is important for us to have that diversity and, 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 and again, in schools, but um, that idea that Eurocentric design is the design blueprint, I think we need to do away with that at, at the end of it. And I do want to give the link to you for the Black Canadian Interior Designers um, Instagram page because I think that when we are on these panel discussions, we become like the only Black designers and there's so much more of us. Um, and so, and again, I think like Nikki said, 
if you're doing something or holding something, don't come to us because you're looking for a black designer. Maybe um, do a little bit more research, right? Might, might have a strong background in mental health, right? Um, I think each person can tell you what their niche is. So when you're holding these platforms or panel discussions or whatever it is, really first and foremost is what is the skill set that I'm looking at, right? Versus I need to find a black person to be on this discussion because they're black, right? So we really want to move away from that. Um, so I think that's important. <clears throat> but in the event that you are looking for more diversity, um, you can definitely go to the Instagram page or you'll see more work for other designers as well, right? So we can then move away from the tagline of black Canadian designers because after all, like, you know, like you said, we're designers, right? But because of the climate that we're in and the context of these conversations, unfortunately, sometimes we have to identify as such. However, we want to move away from that. Change it to there, badass Canadian design adventure, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's also, because um, I know we do have architects and, and other people that are not interior designers on the call, uh, the, the call, but there is also a group called Beta that is the Black Interior Designer and Architect, sorry, the Black Architect and Interior Designer Association um, that I'm also part of and some of the members on the call are also part of. So um, there are groups out there. So just to put that out there also, if there's students that are looking for support or a community, right. uh, to look to look to those group as well because we are here we are here and they're, they're you know we're united that that's huge someone uh, did bring a question about that about influence and being mentors and so on and so forth that's something where you should it, it, it's, it's important to be conscious of who we're putting in front of our students and, and, and who we're putting out there to kind of represent for the, the younger generation going through with their options I've had students reach out to me during during their project saying they have to do interviews um, I read a project about a life as an interior designer while they're in school and I had a few young black students reach out to me, oh my gosh, we found you and wanted to ask you some questions and they, they would go through their questions and then after that was done, there would be this whole conversation we get to have now for the first time that they never had with someone before. So they got to know that's possible. So that should be something very conscious of really getting us into the school systems and, 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 and mentoring and inspir inspiring, sorry, <laughs> a younger generation. Yeah, so that was definitely uh, one of the questions we still had in the Q&A from the audience was around um, the education, how can we push the representation of newer, younger faces behind the design? Many young black designers come into the scene having so much work under their belt, but because we're working under people, we don't get the recognition. Well, I, th I think hiring younger designers, I mean, as you as an employer, um, again, I can't, I can't, I can't say this enough. How, you, if you have a room and it all looks the same way and you're employing these people and you rely on these people as influence and it, they all look the same way and have the same influence to come from the same basic background, how do you feel that's the most valuable system for your company to operate? It just doesn't make sense, right? It's like having the Canadian government run by all older white men. Well, you're kind of missing a lot of voices there. It's not that they're all not, they may all be brilliant, but how do you not have women in there? How do you not have um, ethics? It, you don't, you're not running the most efficient company as possible. So you as an employer, for you to have people who don't think like you, have different influences than you, it's only going to make you that much better, right? So, I mean, I think this is common sense, but we have to be, I think that starts with when you look around the room, if you're all the same, that you should ask yourself why, why? And, speak, and speaking specifically to the younger, younger um interior designers that are coming up that question of you know how do I be recognized even like because I'm working under somebody know that you it's not a black issue all younger designers feel the same way in the sense yeah. of like you're working under somebody you're you know you're you know you're toiling away to create this product and at the end of the day that firm is getting the recognition for it or that that principal is getting the, the recognition for it that's not a black um, specific issue that you're feeling um, and I think once you start feeling that then you start you have to start thinking about okay now how can I start doing projects where I am at the head of that where I am at the helm of that so then you can start putting out the work that comes from your mind that comes from your heart um, and then start highlighting that I think with all of us um, that are on the panel we all we all promote our work that's how we all started and um, I mean, in terms of us being recognized and seen and appreciated for the work that we do, um, I think it's important that you highlight and take a, a snapshot of this is the work that I've done and start putting it out there and promoting yourself. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have another interesting, great question from Margot Austin. Her question is about excellence and mentorship can help enrich design work being done and encourage the growth of an industry. Can the panelists talk about who inspired them? Okay, I can I can answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when I was younger, I went, my neighbor, she was the head of purchasing at TV Ontario. And as we know, TFO, it's a French network yeah. in Toronto here at Young and Eglinton. And she knew I wanted to be a designer. She's a white woman who spoke French. And she told me, why don't you come job shadow or do co Co-op. Well, I told her I had co-op coming up. So cooperative education really helped me out because I was able to get into the field and kind of figure out what I liked and what I wanted to do. She, she, I was, I was inspired from before because of just the drive. Like my story is, you know, a person who just had to hype herself up <laughs> to do what she wanted to do. But she was she was actually there to give me that footing and being like come sit at the table she i was only 15 16 and i was at meetings with quadrigo architects all technion furniture and i was at those meetings sitting in hearing them discuss like what are they purchasing what materials are they working with walking through the second floor renovation um and and actually seeing what a demo looks like and how to put up studs and so i think having those opportunities of people who can either um inspire you or give you the platform is key especially for younger people because i felt the same way too that i wasn't getting the recognition but then i had to make the decision okay am i going to do this on my own am i going to be the person who's going to spearhead these projects and you have to have that conversation with yourself, with yourself. do you want to be a business owner do you want to take on this but um, her name was Michelle Maurice and she was my neighbor and she was a huge inspiration to help make that seem possible because she literally carried me on and was like come come into the office and showed me little etiquette even in working in an office corporate culture um, down to being a part of conversations with architects. So um, I was blessed to have that experience, but I, I found, I, I don't know, the inspiration just, I think that for me, it was just a drive that was just within me that I felt inspired by either nature or, you know, just things around me or the lifestyle that I wanted to live. And I had to start putting the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think, I think Margot, I think oh, go ahead. Yeah, so to answer Margo's question, um, so no, I do agree, excellence and mentorship um, definitely enriches design work, right? Uh, unfortunately, my path was a little bit different. I did try to seek out for mentorship and even shadowing opportunities and things like that. I got all no's. And so that really inspired me to start my own business to put a team together, I was very blessed to have a really good contractor who started with me. Um, and so through that, I just started uh, contacting real estate. I started off staging, that's how I started my business. So I started contacting real estate agents that I knew of. I started contacting everyone in my um, contact list, letting them know this is what I'm wanting to do. Um, and I had a real estate agent who gave me an opportunity I started off with a vacant home staging, then I was doing occupied home staging. So then I started putting out my work and through that I got the opportunity to then do my first commercial uh, renovation and things kind of just took off from there. So for me, I can't really say that anyone inspired me growing up as an immigrant child. My father, you know, I think I was a privileged immigrant child because my father really was savvy and was able to start his own business. So I just watched him do things on his own because oftentimes there are a lot of barriers to being able to get that support. And so when I got the nose, I didn't get this. It was discouraging, but it didn't stop me. Um, it just kind of just motivated me to say, you know what, I'm not going to go that route of working under someone to get that experience. I'm just going to start it myself. Um, and so from then on, I just started again, continue to showcase my work. And through that, I would get more business coming in. And that's just been the way that I've, continued my journey from that point on. Yeah, I would just uh, say this real quickly. 
I, 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 I see, I was searched out mentorship and stuff and that wasn't accessible. Well, it wasn't very, um, it didn't work out <laughs> and it was a little frustrating. I broke it too. My biggest influence honestly was Scott McGillivray. I mean, just watching him and because I was from an investor standpoint and I was doing that, I was, I was buying properties and so on and so forth. So I religiously taped and watched every show, but he's not a designer, although they work with designers. But as a, when I broke into, when I really focused on being in the industry, I didn't have that mentor. I didn't have stuff. It was the workshops that um, I went to, other designers put on that I got inspired for just for those two or three hours, but no one like a job shadow or anything like that. But as a designer, there wasn't anybody in the industry that, or that I watched and followed. Obviously I, I like some people that work, but there was no mentor or inspiration I drew from. I, I just knew I was an artist and I, I've always had this concept that if someone else can do it, I can do it too. I just haven't done it yet. So let me start doing it. And so I just started doing it. Um. My mentors in my head were, I've had life mentors, but in terms of design and my perspective on how I move through the design space is a little bit different because I don't necessarily call myself an interior designer in that traditional sense. I consider myself yeah. an artist. And yep. um, so the inspirations that I have are based on what I'm feeling at that particular time. One person that I really love is um, Yeo Kusama because she deals with experiential experiences and that's something that I love. Um, so when I'm talking about how I, um, what inspires me when it comes to design is how people use space and the people that live in those spaces. So that's where I kind of find my inspiration. Um, and then mentorship is, is generally whoever um, I've put in my head is my BFF for that time, even though they don't know me or they, <laughs> <laughs> even though they don't know me or that I exist, but that's where I, I just kind of, yeah, they're my BFF and that's where I kind yeah. of pull and draw <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's so important. I, 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 I use the word interior design because that helps people understand where the medium I work in, but I'm an artist too. And I think that's so important to set out there for, especially the younger generation. We work in an art form, whether you're a decorator or interior, it, it, it really doesn't matter. You want to be trained and you want to know what you're doing but you're not limited by whatever uh, boundaries are put on you by a school system or by society. Because I, I personally do way more than what is considered to be interior design. Like I, so I paint, I do all, all sorts of different things. I've actually designed and built an entire home, right? And I'm not an architect. So I've worked with architects. So it, it's really about being creative and, and, and expressing yourself how you're going to express. And when you start to get passionate about, and then you, when you start to get passionate about something, you're going to want to learn how to be excellent in it. And then you, that's where the training comes in. And that's where the mentorship is very, very powerful because it can avoid help you avoid making mistakes when working with clients right but it's i think the boundaries are really important to kind of ignore it's just we need to express ourselves and be free They're, therefore that's going to give us access to more influences outside of the interior design world because Absolutely. then you start repeating the same designs as long as i can be influenced by a painter i can be influenced by a car designer and bring that into design right um Design, design, art is art, right? My background is not interior design. I'm an artist. I sculpt, I photography, I, I shot videos. So I bring all of that. What's the lighting for this room? What's the stuff? And that's the same with, a lot, I believe, a lot of um, people on this panel where we're going to bring, bring, bring influences based on space and beauty, not just because of this, um, what we're taught in school to be interior design. I think just to add to, to Michael's point, because we are very similar in the way that we approach our, our work, because you're both artists, and first and foremost. Um, but I think for the younger generation or whoever's on this call, if you're looking in terms of mentorship and you're finding, I mean, obviously you have us on the panel and we're always open to, to speaking to people. But if you're finding yeah. that there's a barrier or there's an issue, then like Michael was saying, look for what exactly it is that you're looking for. Because sometimes you can break down what it is that you're needing into segments. And perhaps what you actually need is somebody that's really good at business or somebody that's really good at marketing or somebody who's really good at um, conceptualizing things. And then you start to, then you start looking at it. Okay, well, if I'm not, if I don't necessarily need to go to an interior designer, if there's a barrier there, if you go to somebody that's really great at business, they're not going to feel like there's any sense of competition or there's, yeah. and that they're losing anything and they can help you specifically in looking at that particular segment. Um, so if you look at your, your work or the, what you're trying to accomplish in that way and you start breaking it down, then you begin to see that the doors are very easily open because people don't feel like there's any sort of resistance um, there. 
Uh, that's awesome advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. What a chat. I can't believe it went by so quickly. And thank you to our audience for all your wonderful questions. We do have um, from Maya, there's another, I, I typed into the chat um, some resources that Maya has added beyond the built, which is actively looking for diverse designers to promote. Um, our next steps, we really want to form some you know, uh, structure and some committees to some of these key topics that we've gone through. We know the wish list, <laughs> right, Nikki? <laughs> and um, some things that I've heard as common themes throughout, like looking to collaborate um, with other in industries for inspiration. I uh, heard loud and clear that we need everyone in our design community. We all need to make noise and to instill change. We really want to focus on that. Um, we want to approach and collaborate on a larger scale, approach perhaps governments, uh, centers, associations, media to focus on what we consider to be the best in the industry. We have um, some demographics and appreciation in design and recognition of cultures such as, um, and including donations. That was an very interesting idea. Uh, we have support mechanisms for larger scale projects such as commercial work and other unfamiliar territory. And sharing formal industry mentorship programs I think would be advantageous such as the ones we've already put into the chat, but also, you know, there's like a Rito and uh, DBA and other organizations that do actually have those in place. And um, on the vendor side, we're doing some work as well. We have one of our vendors is, has uh, come forth and planned to do an education bursary in the industry. So that's very, in, uh, very interesting. You'll hear about more about that in the future. And also at the center, at the Toronto International Design Center, I mentioned last time we have a marketplace opening in August. We now formally have a one-year lease uh, offer to a Black-owned business. We'll have an application process. You'll, you'll also be hearing more about that. So, and if other vendors are on the call or hearing this, we'd love to hear more from you. And most of all, you know, for next steps, we really want to tackle the education one as well. So on July 28th, we're going to have another wonderful talk. And uh, in the meantime, we will follow up with attendees of all of the first two sessions and see where if you have interest in joining us in some committee work, we would uh, love to hear from you as well. So thank you very much. Any last words from our guests today? Oh, thank you guys for joining. Um, I love the comments, by the way. Uh, Maya Rafi is just so funny. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> He's a great person on top of that. Not just funny, but he's also a person. Lovely. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and I exactly. forgot to mention Melissa Tossel's idea. We just talked about this yesterday. Um, she wants to form, you know, sort of an ask me anything for, and have designers on. Yes, yes, yes. I yeah. was talking to Maya about that. Yes, yes, yes. So we want Sorry. you to do it too. We've got lots of things to do. No I'm questions. totally into that, yeah. <laughs> I, I, kind of, I just want to say something. It's it's relevant to what spurred on this conversation, but it's not necessarily design relevant. And it's the, the idea of systemic racism, and how frustrating it is to hear some of the conversations about it. And I and I think it's important that, well, first the word racism has been misused, and I don't think people truly understand it. It's so 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 much times it's blurred with the word um, prejudice or discrimination. They're totally different things. You can be prejudiced and not a racist, and you can be discriminate and not be a race they're not the same thing and systemic racism and this is very important you don't have to be a racist to be playing a part in supporting a systemic racist system the system is already established mm -hmm. and, and you're in it and you're supporting it by not changing it right so you yeah. doesn't make you a racist right. if you are now part and supporting and, and and benefiting from a systemic racist system so there's there doesn't have to be this negative connotation to racism being a bigot 
is more negative, I guess, in the conversation or being prejudiced. And we all have those, right? We're prejudiced against people for a lot of different reasons. For, but a, a racism, is, racism is pretty much a system that's designed to hold another race down by eleva and elevating another race. Now you can't elevate a race without putting all the rest of them down, right? So there's a system that was developed in North America that actually put another race behind another race and that's what racism is. And there's a system that's been put in place until 400 years to master it, which is now called systemic racism. Doesn't mean everybody's a racist, <laughs> right? It just means we have to acknowledge it, understand it and realize the system that we're playing a part, you look around the room, it's pretty much all white. There's something wrong because we're not all white, right? right. You're, you're playing into it. So to break it, you have to acknowledge it and do something different. So I think it's so important for people not to be negatively um, affected by this term. Say, well, I'm not a racist. I love all people. No one said you didn't. And you could be a fantastic person. But how much people have you hired that look like you? How much people at your work that look like you and you've never said anything when you know you go outside and everybody's different, but in your work, it's all the same. I mean, there's things to think about there, right? Thank you. <laughs> That's our tagline. Changing familiarity. Yeah. Love it. Amazing design. Yeah. Hashtag. There's a new one for us. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And James Lockie, James Dodo, he's saying 35 years experience male black Canadian designer. <laughs> he's with us today. Yes, oh, James. Hi, hi James. James. <laughs> I, made, I, made contact. I had some great Celebrating. conversations with James as well. <laughs> Victoria Christie is also here from House and Home. She's been amazing. Nice. Oh, yes, Victoria. Hi, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> no, this has been awesome. I want to thank you for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And thank I know I, so I, wasn't, here, I wasn't everyone. part of the original panel, and I jumped up and said, hey, there's a male voice need to out here, so thank uh, you for it. Right, it's diversified. See, look at that. hundred <laughs> percent. So this was fun, very fun. I, mean, I can't believe the hour and a half went by so fast. So. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest Thank of your day. Have a pleasure. Bye. 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 <laughs>